Hi, yeah, thank you very much. Oh, okay. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm very happy to be here and very I'm always taking the opportunity to talk about Rockabill Island and the turns of Ireland. So as Nigel said, I've been working as a turn warden with Birdwatch Ireland for the past four years. I did three summers on Rockabill Island and I did one summer uh, here this last summer in Kilkill Beach with Little Turns. And so it's a very rewarding job. It's, I love doing it and uh, I can't really see myself stopping anytime soon. And um, so this talk, I wanted to go through the east to west, it's the turns of the Irish Sea. And that's from the east of Ireland to where you guys are over in Wales, west of us. And I hope these slides work now. <laughs> okay, yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, this is a picture of me taken from the bill, uh, looking over onto the rock. So Rockabill is two small islets that make up the one island, and one is called the rock, and the other is called the bill, and hence Rockabill. There we go. So yes, a brief his my brief history is I graduated from Bangor University. I did a degree in zoology and then I did a master's in uh, working with cichlid fish of Tanzania. So very different from what I'm doing at the moment, working with seabirds, but not entirely different. I'm still working uh, with the sea. I came home from Wales after I finished my master's and a bit difficult to find a job. I did a lot of volunteering for a couple of years while I worked, you know, here and there doing retail and doing uh, customer service and things like that. But I volunteered with Birdwatch for years and uh, this job comes up each summer. I applied for it and I got it. I was delighted. Before that, I did a bit of work in Wales and here in Ireland doing bat surveys. And then again, a very big change from uh, bats to birds, but it's all very good experience. And I find that all of it is kind of linked in with field research anyway. So. Yeah, I was a warden from 2019 to 2021 on Rockabill, and then I did this year in 2022 here in Kilcool Beach. So I uh, hope all of you can see this map here. And um, we have five species of terns breeding in Ireland. And the main one that everyone loves is the Rosia tern. The Rosia tern breeds on Rockabill Island. Uh, up here off the north coast of Dublin and down in County Wexford in Ladies Island Lake. So it's, they breed down here in Wexford um, on a small inland island uh, in, on a lake. And then we have common tern, a uh, very noisy tern comparison to the roseates and they are on Rockabill Island as well and they also breed on Docky Island and Dublin Port. So I have Rockabill Island marked with a star here and the two yellow ones is Dublin Port where they breed on these floating rafts that Birdwatch Ireland and the Dublin Port and the National uh, um, Parks and Wildlife Services uh developed to get uh to try and encourage more breeding turns here in inside of dublin and when that was set up with birthwatch ireland the main aim was to try and get some of them to move from rockabill because rockabill was becoming very overpopulated and then docky island is a much smaller island it's down in south dublin closer to wicklow and um, it's a uh, very historical island and you can see it very easily uh, if you're getting the train from Bray in Wicklow up to Dublin, uh, which are trains it runs along the coastline and you can see Doggy Island there from as you're traveling into the city centre. Arctic Turns are next, they are uh, the 
big migrators, they have the longest migration of any of the terns, and they also breed on Rockabill. We have a small number breeding on Rockabill, not nearly as many as Rosia terns or common terns, and then they also breed on Docky Island. So one of the main colonies in Ireland off the East Coast, especially in Dublin, is Docky Island, and Birdwatch Ireland has been trying for years to try and encourage Arctic terns to be breeding on Docky Island and had some large difficulties over years with rats and they finally gotten the rat population under control and my colleague Tara has been working for the past five years on Docky Island and uh, it's been doing great. The Arctic tern population is now slowly starting to build and last in 20. 21, they had the first fledglings on Docky Island, first Arctic Turn fledglings. So it's big news in Birdwatch Ireland. And the next one is the little turn. That's the sm our smallest turn in Ireland. They nest along the east coast as well. Um, so that uh, they nest in a bit of a wider range. The first one they nest in is Kilkool. It's the main one. That Kilkool is a beach um, just here in Wicklow. Uh, you see this little blue point here. And then another one is Portran, which is in North Dublin, kind of in between Dublin Port and Rockabill. It's just a little bit south of Rockabill. And then there is also one in Baltray in County Louth, which isn't monitored by Birdwatch Ireland and that's kind of closer in here. I couldn't mark it on this map because uh, it looked it didn't show up very well, but it's very close to Portran. And then the other one is a new one. They found this year, they found that in Curacool Beach down in County Wexford, a uh, little bit north of Ladies Island, they found a small colony of little terns nesting on the shingle beach there and National Parks and Wildlife Services got straight in to try and fence off the beach and protect them and hopefully we're trying to encourage it to try and get it as a Birdwatch Ireland project in link with Kilcool and Portran Beach. Uh, so hopefully that goes ahead. Um, yeah, our last and final one is the sandwich turn. We don't get too many sandwich turns in Ireland. We have a few show up on Rockabill Island and in Dublin Port, but they don't breed there. The only place they breed is on Ladies Island down in County Wexford down here. Uh -huh. So I'm going to be mainly talking about two of the colonies today, and that's Rockable Island. I will talk a little bit more about Rockable Island because I've spent a lot more time there. And then the other one is Kilkool Beach. And it's a little bit, um, quite a bit of a distance between them, like not too much distance for a turn, but it would be quite a walk from myself or anyone else. And it's a what different range of habitats. Rockabill Island is a small island, and then the Kilkool Beach is a shingle and sandy beach that gets a lot of public traffic and uh, foot traffic and a lot of dog walkers. Now, so Rockabill Island, what's the big deal about Rockabill Island? And um, it's the largest rosier tern colony in Europe, not just in Ireland. And it's one of the largest tern colonies as a whole. So we have rosia terns, common terns and arctic terns all nesting on this tiny little island off the coast of Dublin and we get the odd visitor every now and then. Some sandwich terns show up and we get a couple of migrants, some uh, passerines every now and then. And But rose, rosia terns on Ireland are the rosia terns on Rockabill Island. They're the main focus of the of Rockabill Island and they're kind of the key species that Birdwatch Ireland looks after out there. And um, it's the largest rosia tern colony in Ireland and holds over 80% of British, Irish and French breeding pairs and 61% of pairs from Europe and the Azores nest on Rockabill Island. So it's a massively important colony in terms of breeding seabirds and breeding terns and it's not just not just for Ireland but for Britain and for Europe it's uh, of huge importance uh, in conservation and it's largely considered one of Birdwatch Ireland's big success stories. Um, Rockabill Island, this is it on the map off the coast of Skerries, 
so Scaries is here and out just a little bit it's this tiny little dot here is Rockable down here south is Lambay Island much bigger um it's a little bit more popular a lot more you can't visit Lambay Island and you can't visit Dawkey Island and or you can't visit Rockable Island sometimes they let visitors out to Rock to Dawkey Rockable you're not really supposed to go out there but some people uh, think it's abandoned and show up and it uh, can be quite scary when you're out there by yourself but Rockabill it's made up of two small islets like I said the rock and the bill the rock is the main one it has the lighthouse and the lighthouse keeper's house and in total the two of them make up about 0.9 hectares so it's very very tiny and for all of these birds to be bringing to be flying there and breeding there it is amazing in my opinion and you can't really I can't explain and I cannot prepare anyone for the noise of Rockabill Island when with oh, so many turns there there's thousands and thousands of seabirds on this tiny island that's the rock a nice view of it there with the lighthouse and this is the bill so the bill is a lot rougher it doesn't have any buildings on it at all but it does have some arctic terns nesting there and it also has some other seabirds nesting on it so we do monitor the bill as well uh, we monitor both islands and uh, we take a small dinghy boat that we uh, inflate over and back between them across this channel when that channel is at low tide you can walk there if you're very very lucky at very low tide uh, it's a bit slippery but not too bad so Rockabill Lighthouse, before it was well known for its turns, it was most well known for the lighthouse and just a little bit of a history of the lighthouse. So it was developed, first established in 1860 and then in 1980 it was converted to electric. In 1989 it, the light was automatic and that's when Birdwatch Ireland took over and started full-time monitoring of bro rosy turns. So by 1989 there wasn't any lighthouse keepers living on the island and um, there was a few there they would in shift work but uh, that stopped a few years after birdwatch ireland took over so in the early years we were co-inhabiting with some lighthouse keepers but not anymore and um, then in 2006 it was converted to solar power and it, so it's completely self-sufficient and automatic it's monitored from uh head office you know, irish lights inland and uh like many of the other lighthouses uh in ireland and just where does rockabill island and its lighthouse come into terms of the history of conservation i've just done a little brief timeline here in um the very beginning uh, back in 1853 and in 1900, so early, early, um, early 20th century, late 19th century, uh, these two books were published, and they were some of the most well-known books in ornithology and uh, bird watching at the time. They're like this one here uh, by Washers. Uh, published in 1950, in 1853, okay, excuse me, um, that was largely considered one of the first ornithology books on um, ornithology in Ireland. And this book is of import for Rockabill because in 1850, Waters and his team went out to Rockabill to uh, discover what birds were out there. And that's largely considered the first count of rosier terns on Rockabill. Um, we that we don't really have very many records at that time of turn colonies in Ireland and uh, in this book is kind of one of the first recorded counts of rosia turns this one the birds of Ireland is one of the it's the largely considered the very very first bird guidebook in Ireland um published by Usher and Warren, and it's a huge collector's item in Birdwatch for bird watchers in Ireland. And um, I was gifted it for my 30th birthday last year. <laughs> my auntie found it uh, in um, an auction house while she was on tour, and uh, I was delighted with it. And the first bird I went to, of course, was the Rosia Tern, and then the Common Terns <laughs> and the Arctic Terns. And 
unfortunately, when this book was published in 1900, it was seen that there was no birds nesting, no terns nesting on Rockabill at the time. And that's largely considered uh, due to shooting, well, not large, it's considered most likely what happened was due to shooting and egg collecting, the tern colony was uh, completely destroyed and wiped out. So when Waters went out the first time, he counted approximately 70 or 80 individual per birds. Uh, of Rosia Turns nesting. And then when Birdwatch Ireland came in in 1989, their first count was less than 200 birds. So it recovered a little bit over the years, but not, uh, to the ex not nearly to the extent of the numbers that we have today. So in 1989, um, conservation and bird conservation started to pick up everywhere. There's a little tiny uh, group formed by some lovely ladies there in Britain, you might know owe them, it's called the RSPB. <laughs> and then in 1969, Birdwatch Ireland was established. So I say established instead of founded was because a lot of original Birdwatch members were part of the RSPB. And we did, like it took us a little bit of time to catch up here in Ireland, but not really. We had a lot of lot going on in at the time in 1916 we had our rebellion and that's when we broke away from British rule so these books and a lot of the publications that came around at the same time were all published under well Ireland was under British rule and under British publications and um, so when we developed our own government uh, after we broke away from British rule uh, the first one of the first big laws uh, for wildlife was established in 1930 and that's the Wild Birds Protection Act and that prohibited shooting of birds in the breeding season as well as prohibiting egg collecting of any birds. It's been developed a lot through Irish government through the years and now it's completely prohibited to disturb a nesting birds at any time uh, in the any time of year here in Ireland not just during the breeding season. and. Um, a lot, uh, kind of, a lot more kind of went on through the years. A couple of years in 1979, a little bit before the lighthouses considered became electric. Uh, the EU birds, um, EU birds directive was uh, initiated, and under that act, Rockabill was designated a special protected area. So that gave it a lot of protection, not just under Irish law, but under European law. And this is largely due to the breeding seabirds on Rockabill. And um, so this, uh, when it was declared a special protected area that gave Birdwatch Ireland a lot of uh, uh, helped in our argument to say that this area needs to be monitored. And so it, that's when Birdwatch moved in and started full time monitoring. And then Rosie in 2015 to 2020, Rosie Turn Life Project was developed. You might have heard of this. It's one that Birdwatch Ireland uh, did in collaboration with the RSPB and North Wales Wildlife Trust, as well as a couple of other organisations to help protect and monitor known colonies of breeding Rosie Turns around Britain and Ireland and Europe. And um, most of them are in Britain and Ireland. And through this project, it was we started to develop ways to encourage smaller colonies to try and help the birds from Rockabill move away from Rockabill, so to speak, so that uh, they're not all concentrated in one small area. Because if anything happens um, to Rockabill because of climate change or very bad storms, and um, the entire population would be worth wiped out nearly. And that's uh, such a huge population in, in, for Europe. And today the turn colony is still going strong. I don't have the numbers from 2022. I have some numbers from 2021, but I am hoping to get the Rockabill report for 2022 in the post very soon and have the numbers. But I've heard from this year's wardens that it went very, very well. Uh, we had a bit of a scare with avian flu, but thankfully avian flu didn't get into any colonies here in Ireland. And uh, we still had a lot of bird, like a lot of chicks managing to fledge. Uh, so this is an excerpt from that book, Usher and Warren, The Birds of Ireland. And like I said, in 
between 1900 from when this book was published in 1989, the population recovered a bit. It went from zero to uh, uh, approximately 200, just under 200 pairs, which is a good recovery over that time. Um, but it was still a very, very tiny colony compared to it now. So now um, Birdwatch is doing very well and the Rosie turns are doing very well out on Rockabill. In 2021, there was 1,704 breeding pairs, which is which was a record high for Rockabill that year. And that's such a huge con uh, recovery when you consider it was 30 years as opposed to 89 years um, to get to just under 200. But the numbers have remained between 1,600 and 1,700 since about 2018. They fluctuated between those two highs, so it's stayed relatively stable now. It, was, it increased uh, over the decades and now it's getting to kind of a, a stable pop, um, measurement. The common terns on Rockabill, there was 1,670 common terns on, in 2021. And that's not as many as there have been historically up until about 2019 or 2018. There was around between 1,800 and 2,000 breeding pairs of common terns. So the common terns have started to decline. We don't know exactly why that is. We've been looking into it and we are hoping it is because they're starting to move to these other colonies some more numbers are being found in Dublin Port and some more numbers are being found on Dalkey Island. So we're hoping that uh, they are being encouraged to breed in other areas. And so this is done. How did we get to these numbers? Oh, as well as that, there's, sorry, I've got 55 Arctic terns nesting on Rockville. And we've had approximately 60 pair, 60 50 to 60 breeding pairs of Arctic terns for the last five years. They used to breed on the bill, unfortunately, due to overpopulation of gulls. Um, there's no Arctic terns nesting on the bill anymore, but they are, they've moved over to the rock and they are nesting on the rock now. So that's the numbers at the moment for how where Rockabill stands. And it's not just terns nesting on Rockabill. We've got two other breeding pairs, breeding species. Uh, we've got a lovely pair of black legged kitty wakes here and uh, the gorgeous black guillemot. And I, in my opinion, the black guillemot is my favourite. And I think that is largely due to just how quiet it is compared to the rest of them. And I've got a few photos here to show you. And um, as we go through, I'm just going to quickly run through all of the different birds. The roseate terns, they arrive in late April to early March, and the wardens try to get out there kind of by the end of April for the first weekend in March. They are the priority species on Rockabill, and they are one of the scarcest breeding seabirds in Europe. So that emphasizes just the importance of the colony on Rockabill. They like to nest in sheltered areas, areas and they lay kind of between one or two eggs. The odd time you might get a nest with three eggs. And uh, there was a study found done um, that was published in the Irish Birds, which is Birdwatch Ireland's um, scientific journal. And that was that most of the time when three eggs appeared in a nest, it was two females breeding with one male. So a nice uh, throuple going on. And they so because they nest in sheltered areas, the project on Rockabill developed nest boxes. These nest boxes that are laid down flat and they're laid down on the soil to give them a nice sheltered area for that, that's protected from the wind and protected from the weather, as well as protected, a little bit of protection from predators as well. Gulls can't get into them. We've had some small waders, like a turnstone, was able to get in inside to the boxes. But no, but other than that, uh, it offers a lot of protection from predators as well. And uh, sometimes they are a little bit iffy and they don't like to 
nest in the boxes but they'll go for any other sheltered areas so sometimes they'll make a little area for themselves they'll squash down some leaves and the bushes and they'll uh, build a nest in there or sometimes they'll go underneath some rocks or in crevices and sometimes they like to be really awkward and instead of nesting in the boxes they'll nest right beside the boxes <laughs> so this box in particular here is in one of the areas and um you can't see it in this photo but there were no turns nesting in that box there was in fact a nest just behind the box between the box and the rock and then on the other side of the box there was another nest so neither of them decided to nest inside the box they just decided to go right beside it instead common terns they aren't as picky and um, they will nest in open areas and they have this lovely orange bill with the black tip as opposed to the completely black bill that you saw on the rosy terns uh, which shows in the breeding season and uh, it common terns they'll nest on grass or on soil or in it, but they won't nest on the granite rock so any kind of crevice or crack between the rock that has just a little bit of plant life or a little bit of soil they will build a nest on it and sometimes they'll take twigs and leaves off the ground they'll find a collection of them and they'll put them all together and build a nest um, so they are not nearly as picky as the rosier terns. They like to breed along these coastal colonies, but they also do like to breed on inland lakes. And in Rockabill, they prefer the gardens. I'll show you a map of Rockabill later on. Um, but there are some gardens around the lighthouse keeper's house and the lighthouse, which is where the old lighthouse keepers used to grow their food and plant their flowers. And now it's um, overgrown and uh, it's completely taken over. The gardens are completely taken over by common terns. <laughs> um, I don't think that's what the lighthouse keepers anticipated when they were living there. Yeah, so like I said, they'll nest in any kind of little crack um, or area. Um, so this is along the path um, up to the lighthouse keeper's house and any crack in the pavement or any area of little grass or soil or dirt, uh, the common turns will just build a nest there. They'll make a nest and sometimes it'll just be like a tiniest crack in the granite um, or any plant life or any moss or lichen or weeds that are growing up they'll just lay their eggs there. And we also have these stone walls around uh, the buildings and around the gardens. And in when plants are growing up through the cracks in the walls, up into the top of the walls, some of the common terns will nest on the top of the walls. It's not a great place to build a nest. Once, if the eggs don't roll off, once the chicks hatch, they just wander off and fall down. And a lot of common terns, a lot of common turn chicks are found later on on the path running around a little bit lost and the wardens have to gather them up and put them somewhere safe. Um, so oh, the common turns are the very big aggressors uh, out of the turn, out of the five turns that we have. And this aggression is, un, it's hard to explain. It's very, very, it's very, very, difficult to live with is let me just put it that way and um, you have to do you do have to take it in your stride and get used to it common terns will do this type of behavior where they will dive bomb any predator and for them uh, the predators out on rockabill or the disturbers out on rockabill are the wardens so they'll go straight for our heads and they also like to do this kind of thing where they just poo on us all the time so they uh, won't and it's not just like oh an accidental poo that you have when you get like have a bird pooing on you and it's bad luck they will aim the poo straight for you <laughs> straight for your face and straight for everyone so that's why all the wardens we go around in raincoats and fully weather gear even on the hottest of days and whatever color your raincoat is it does develop this nice white coating and a bit of a bleached <laughs> color by the end of the season as well as dive bombing us they will also dread and fly out to sea and attack any avian predators or any disturbers. So um, 
these can be if we have a helicopter flying overhead or a plane or uh, if they see a drone flying sometimes people will fly drones around Rockabill they're not allowed to and they're not supposed to so once one goes up it's fair we do notice because uh, we can tell by the quiet once uh, you get so used to the noise that when everything goes quiet on Rockabill that's you know that's when something's wrong and um, but they will just dread out to sea and chase away any uh, avian predator that comes near them so the arctic tern is the least inhabited bird on Ireland or on Rockabill Island on the island uh, it's such a lovely bird. I think it's absolutely gorgeous with its forked tail and its lovely red bill. They're much smaller than common terns and rosia terns. They have the longest distance to travel to Rockabill, so they usually show up a little bit later. They might show up kind of towards the end of March, and that's when we'll start seeing them. We they kind of they used to nest on the rock bill for a very long time. And they don't do that anymore, but most of the time, most years, the first place we will see them in, on, is on the bill. And then eventually we'll see them, they'll start to show up on the rock as well. And um, so we have a very small colony of about kind of 55 to 60 pairs, and they like to lay one or two eggs. And they're like the common terns, they'll nest out in the open, they'll nest kind of anywhere in little, any crack or crevice that they can. And then our cliff nesters are the black-legged kittiwakes, uh, absolute gorgeous birds. They're the medium-sized gull species. We don't monitor them as rigorously as the terns, but we do keep an eye on them and kind of try to keep an eye on uh, when the eggs appear and when the chicks appear. And uh, we do ring them as well. There's approximately 250 pairs on Rockabill, and they're they're kind of micro colonies around the island. There's um, three little colonies of cliff nesters on the rock. And then there's a couple over on the bill as well. And they will nest, uh, sometimes they'll nest four eggs. Most of the time it's two or three. But in the past few years, we've had quite a few with four, four, nests, four eggs and four chicks in the nest. Then we have the black guillemot, the smallest little bird. We have developed um, these other nest boxes, uh, which inside this nest box, it has a tunnel going into this little uh, cavern space that's built in here. And it provides them like a lot of nice, nice little cozy spot for, for protection to lay the eggs and uh, protect the chicks. And as well as that, they'll also nest in these natural spaces in the gaps in the brick walls. So any we have little, little spaces or gaps through these in these stone walls, they will nest in there. And they can nest one or two eggs. Sometimes we get three. It's rare, but sometimes it does happen. And uh, their chicks are tiny and very small and fluffy, and then they just get very big uh, very, very quickly. And um, they will nest in these walls and in these nest boxes. We have some of these nest boxes above the pier and under the helipad on the island. Um, so we would start uh, in when we arrive in late April or May, uh, we'd start off doing these early morning counts of the black guillemots and the uh, kitty wakes to try and determine uh, in, uh, the numbers and how many breeding pairs we might have, or at least how many individuals are showing up on the island. And then we have a couple of other breeding birds that are a bit rarer, rarities. Um, they're a lot more common on the mainland. So in 2021, we got, we got very lucky. We had a few nests of blackbirds and we had a couple of these gorgeous little blackbird fledglings popping around. And um, we tried to recycle and we compost everything um, when we're out there. You can't, we can't like just throw it in the rubbish. There's no rubbish collection on Rockville. So and um, we found a lot of the blackbirds and the little chicks and fledglings were foraging in our bucket where we kept the compost before we went and we dumped it in the big compost heap. And so we found them just foraging and that didn't get in. They seemed to be have quite an appetite. And we had uh, we had four 
uh, clutches, I think. Yeah, four clutches. That's what I have here. Uh, we had three or four clutches, two in some of the gardens in the bushes, and uh, we did manage to ring three of the fledglings, which was very exciting for me. This little uh, fledgling, I have a little photo here. It was the first passer I ringed. I've done so many ringing of seabirds over the years, and that was my very first pass around, so it was very exciting. Um, we weren't as lucky with rock pipits in terms of ringing. We didn't manage to catch any, but we did have one that we found, and we had two fledglings, and then we found remnants of two other rock pipit nests, but we didn't see any more birds or any more fledglings, but we think we might have had two pairs breeding on the on the bill. And then we have a lot of visitors. Uh, so these are some of the some of the visitors we get out in Rockabill. Over on Lambay Island that I showed you earlier, there are puffins. There's a couple of puffins nesting on them and there's some a gannet colony. So we get gannets flying by. We don't get them landing, but we do have some puffins and razor bills and common guillemots that land on. They come in uh, at low tide or at mid tide and rest on the island, just kind of around the outer edges of the island. And then we have this influx of waders. We get some purple sandpiper and some turnstone uh, at the beginning of the season and then at the very end kind of in August just as we're about to leave we see a couple of manx shearwaters flying by cormorants on the bill trying their wings and then every now and then we might be lucky and get a couple of passerines so uh, over the years we've had some wren some robin uh, kind of on a stopover flyby and then we had a grasshopper warbler one year, um, that uh, the year before I arrived, and a spotted flycatcher. So they were the two rarities on Rockabill. Uh, so there's a nice, even though it's such a tiny space, there is a nice variety of bird life out there. One of the visitors you can always count on, uh, like clockwork, every single year. Bird, uh, Rockabill will get a homing pigeon <laughs> and it usually shows up after a storm. One will just show up for shelter. And um, this one that I have here uh, was from 2019. He stuck around till he showed up maybe about two weeks before we were due to leave and he stayed till the very end of the season. We ended up having to pack him in a box and carry him off on the boat with us when we left. And then my manager, Steve, our head of seabird conservation and bird watch. Uh, he kept him with his chickens for a few days before he flew off. This guy here, his name was Blue. Uh, he showed up after a really big storm and came right into the house. Like um, the other two wardens walked right past him as they came in the door. And then I looked down and saw he was there hiding behind the front door. And we, caught, we picked him up quite easily. He was exhausted and rang the number uh he's his owner was still looking for them they had had one race and then they had all shut down because of covid and thankfully we were able to get this guy off a couple of days later when we had some visitors and uh he was picked up in scary's harbor and brought home and uh, so uh but he flew all the way down from northern ireland because we don't have too many uh pigeon racers in rural but there's a lot lot a lot of groups up in northern ireland i think um, some other fauna that we get, uh, there's no mammals on Rockabill. We get a couple of dolphins and a couple of minky whale uh, around the place and some harbour porpoise. Um, on a nice clear day, you might get, get some nice cetaceans, but we do have some seals that show up. They don't live on the island. They I live over on Lambay, but they do come over and visit. And there's a colony that comes in at low tide. Uh, numbers kind of fluctuate between 10 and 20, depending on the day. And in 2020, we got very, very lucky. This little guy here showed up. He appeared, he cropped, popped up and came right in close to the pier. And we were able to sit next to him for a couple of hours and he didn't meet. This is a, a common seal pup. Uh, it was still it was gorgeous, lovely and fluffy still, and mum was floating about watching us uh, in the sea, popping off and popping her head up to make sure he was still there and we weren't doing anything. And then we have a couple of invertebrates, uh, a bumble, some bumblebees might show up in the garden, not very often. When they do, they're usually exhausted and we give them some sugar water. We get a lot of jellyfish around the island. 
especially in you know, June, July, we have uh, compass jellyfish, but we've also had lion's mane jellyfish and some other jellyfish species show up and it kind of makes the water uh, impossible to swim in because there's just so many of them. And um, so you really need to have some, have a wet suit or a dry suit for protection. So let's go down to Kilkool Beach, the difference in Kilkool Beach, it's a little bit further down south, not too far for, for the turns. It's along this, so it's a long stretch of shingle beach and a section of the beach is fenced off every year for the little turns. This is our hide here, lovely. This is uh, Steve, you'll hear me mentioning him a lot. He's the head of seabird conservation. And uh, they. this photo was taken on a very lovely day when our Minister for Environment and Conservation came out to visit in the project. This is one of the other wardens I worked with, Chris. Um, He's been working on Kilkool for six or six years now. And I think, yeah, I don't see him stopping anytime soon. Um, yeah, just before this picture was taken, uh, our new uh, CEO of Birdwatch came over to visit and they, she went down to the little town colony and it was lashing rain horrible horrible weather they got soaked so steve was delighted when the minister showed up it was lovely and sunny this is what the sign we put up for the public we like to this is a bit of public awareness we have a chalkboard where we put up um the colony news for uh, dog walkers and the locals who walk the beach to read and they can see what's going on in the colony it is ireland's largest little turn colony there is currently 250 pairs. In 2022, there was 205 nesting pairs recorded. We got up to about 300 nests, but we, uh, uh, 300 nests that we found, but 245 of them were active nesting pairs. It is currently, um, the little terns, they are amber listed in Ireland, and that due to the decline of like the small breeding populations that we find around the country. We don't have too many little turn colonies. And like I mentioned earlier, the, there's about three or four, the main three, and then this new little one that they found down in Wexford. So hopefully that's some good news. Um, they were first recorded to be breeding on Kilkool in 1979. Steve did a lot of work over the years to try and really get this project off the ground. And it's done very well. Considering that Rockabill is, in terms of conservation, one of Birdwatch Ireland's biggest success stories in terms of numbers, Kilkool is one of the most well-known ones. Loads of people, whenever I tell them that I work with terns, they always say, oh, were you down on Kilkool? I'm like, oh, yeah, once. <laughs> so uh, the locals love, love it. They're very proud of this project. And a lot more people and a lot more Birdwatch Ireland members will know more about Kilkool than they will about Rockabill. So these are the little terns. Um, they are these very, very small terns, this little kind of yellow beak. Um, this one with the yellow ring, I'll show you in better detail later. Uh, he was colour ringed in Wales and he was nesting on Kilkool this year. They arrive at the same time with the common terns, late April, early March. By the time we had gotten the fences up, we already found uh, some pairs nesting. Um, they are the priority species on Kilkool Beach, but we do get some other breeding species. And compared to like other species, I find them very, very hard to find because their eggs and their chicks are very well camouflaged in the shingle and in the stones. Um, the other species that we get uh, is not one of the priority species, but it is one of high interest. We try to ring as many of them as we can. It's the ring plover. They're a lovely resident uh, species in Ireland, but they are also a winter visitor. We get a lot more of them in the winter, so the numbers are huge at the moment. And um, there's a tiny amount of them breeding around the eastern coastlines, but one of the main places that they have started breeding is on Kilkool. And what we found, or uh, you might find this in any, any other colony on a beach, is if you set up the space to protect the area, it, more species that breed on these shingle beach beaches are more that will breed on these stony paths or on in the grasses and in the sand they'll nest in the areas as well 
Um, and the little terns don't seem to be too bothered by the ringed plover. They kind of co-inhabit the same space and they're very good. In 2022, this year, we had over 14 nests and all, almost all of them reared chicks. And um, we, we had a very good year for ringed plover this year. And then another species we have nesting occasionally down there is the oyster catcher. So it's a nice resident wader. Uh, it's one of my favorite raiders, waders around Ireland. And we had two nests in 2022 inside the colony and two outside the colony fence and uh, in other parts of the beaches that we kind of kept an eye on a little bit more. And they don't co inhabit with the little terns as well as the ringed plover do. They're a little bit noisier. They also predate the eggs. And um, so anytime they got up and moved around their nest or left their nest for a little bit, the terns would start mobbing them. And um, but they got on well. Once the chicks did hatch, they got out of the colony and uh, they moved to another area where they could start teaching their chicks how to fend for themselves. Um, so some other birds might get out. Kilcool is a hot spot for bird life, really, and it's a very popular spot for bird watchers all throughout the year. This year we had some juvenile starlings around the place. We had a field fair for a couple of days. We get a lot, a good few stone chats around that area in the summer, and then. Um, I have a map that I will show you a little bit later. But there's a railway line, an old railway line that runs parallel to the beach and on the other side of this railway line national parks and wildlife services have set up some flooded fields to uh, encourage breeding lapwing so it's now uh, the fields on the other side of the turn colony uh, are a breeding ground for a protected breeding ground for uh, lapwing and you get some gorgeous uh, i don't have too many good pictures of them they're very hard to spot but they are gorgeous birds when you see them in the fields and when we were driving up and down from the colony we had to keep an eye out for chicks running in and out on these flooded fields you get some other birds as well you get some curlews and hooper swan hooper swan showed up in summer which surprised us we get a lot of mute swans but we did find a hooper swan which was like you're not supposed to be there at this time of year and then we had a good few ducks lots of mallards and a teal for a little bit but we also had a shell duck uh, breeding and we had a pair of shell duck rearing loads of little ducklings there's two other pairs of mallards that had ducklings as well and you'd see them all together kind of in this crash type of area swimming around the, the lake uh, is dead cute and um, on Kilkill we don't have any seals popping up and sticking around like we did on Rockabill but we get a couple floating by us and um, a really nice day you might see some harbour porpoise as well uh, this is a lovely shot that one of the lads got of the uh, the seal with his dinner for the day and my fellow warden Peter Kavanagh he had a macro lens and he took some gorgeous photos of the insects around the grassland uh, lots of lovely butterflies and dragonflies and caterpillars this is just a just a tiny fragment of the selection that we had um, uh, of insect activity um, I don't know too many of the species and uh, the, so if anyone's interested, you can touch, I can give you Peter, he would, he knows a lot more about them than I do. Okay, so the two main questions I get when I tell people that I am a turn warden for Birdwatch Ireland is, uh, God, what is it like living out on an island? Like, what's it like living out there? And do you actually live out there for the entire season or some variation of that? And, and then the other question is, what the what did the turn wardens do? Like, what is our role? How do we uh, help these, help manage these species? And so I will just go into the first one. Um, first question there, what's it like living out there? And uh, it kind of has its pros and cons. I personally enjoy living out there. It's secluded and isolated. It's quiet. If you're an introvert, it's a great place. Um, but it does have, <laughs> It does have its cons and there's limited electricity. Uh, we had up until uh, 2021, we didn't have access to the backup generators that, um, that powers the house. We had our own small little uh, generator that we put on in the evenings to charge our laptops and to um, cook our dinners and run the fridges and things like that. Um, 
But then in 2022, we negotiated with Irish Lights and National Parks and Wildlife um, to get access to the power. So the lighthouse is run by solar power and these solar panels charge up these backup uh, batteries, which when they're turned on, they power the entire house as well as the lighthouse if the solar panels should fail. And um, so without electricity, we don't have any central heating. We don't have any hot water. There is a shower, but it doesn't work. It's an electric shower. So once the electricity, we did get electricity, we got the, we got hot water and we were able to have showers and it was brilliant. Before that, uh, we were boiling water on the gas stove and filling up buckets and just giving ourselves a bit of a sponge bath. And um, so there's nowhere to go on Rockabill for food or uh, if you want to get off to go for a like go for a shower or get home for a little bit. The advice that we all get told is to bring about three months of food in case anything happens and no one can get out to us and um, just make sure we have plenty of food for the season. So it's a lot of tins of beans, tins of tomatoes, non-perishable stuff. And while you're out there, you start getting cravings for, you don't really get cravings for chocolate and junk food like that. You start getting cravings for fresh produce like broccoli and fresh carrots and fresh strawberries. Those are always the things I asked for <laughs> um, uh, whenever people were coming over to visit and when we were getting a shop brought over to us. So just to give a little bit of a, a more insight into what life is like out on Rockabill. It is the best place to be when there's a global pandemic going on. This is a small piece that was done by RTE News, uh, Radio Telethi Sharon, our main TV channel in Ireland. Um, it's a small little fluff piece. They came out to visit us and to film us when they found out that there were two people living on an island uh, off the coast of Dublin uh, by themselves uh, during a during COVID, so they thought it was a brilliant news piece. I'll just let this play um, here. We'll have one of, one of the more interesting pandemic stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a surreal, it's been a surreal experience. Only three of us on the island. Well, three of us and about 8,000 seabirds. <laughs> the pandemic experience that everyone else is having we've, we've had such a different experience it doesn't really feel real to us pretty much the week before we got the briefing from steve and steve said look i don't know if we're going to get you any supplies i don't know if i'm going to be able to get out for the season so just bring enough food for four months and that might be you so. yeah that, that was pretty scary because um I mean, it was locked down, so people had been really told off of panic buying oh, God, <laughs> the supermarkets. Yes. So and we had to go in and buy four months worth of canned goods. <laughs> Definitely the checkout lady. I'm just like, no, no, we're not panic buying. We're just <laughs> going out to an island. It was the worst excuse. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. like, yeah. they didn't believe us. <laughs> Being out here, we don't have electricity as well, and we have limited phone service and internet service. So yeah, it's very solitary lifestyle and it is something you sign up for. A lot of my friends think I'm absolutely insane for doing this. Thing. They're just like, why? Why would you put yourself through that? Um, and I think it's quite funny because now everyone's doing it. Everyone has to stay inside to stay safe and keep each other safe. We've been involved with these chicks' lives right from the beginning. so. When we got here, we cleared out the mallard for them to nest and we put the boxes down. So then throughout the season, you see the birds choose a box. Then one day you find some eggs and then the next day you see some chicks. And then we've been watching those chicks grow up for the last two months. And then you see them flying. It's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we've definitely been in quarantine. <laughs> I don't know if it's actually sunk in yet, because um, I'm still in Ireland mentality. 
yeah, we'll just take it one day at a time and figure it out. And We've got this far. We've got masks on order, so they should be in the post, so. Okay. Yeah, so I hope you enjoyed that. As you can see from that video, there's a lot of birds around. Uh, you saw some of them dive bombing, some of the common terns dive bombing us while we were going around collecting chicks to ring, uh, or when we were in the bushes, or when we were trying to sit on the rocks and do some ring reading. This video was filmed towards the end of the season when there wasn't as many uh, breeding birds around. Once they kind of around August, they you'll wake up one day and half of them have left and they've gone over to this big roost in the mainland and after their chicks have all fledged and but the and then there'll be a couple thousand around for a little while longer then a couple of hundred and it starts to get quieter and quieter um so yeah so that was taken in 2020 during yeah, the height one, of, one of the more interesting uh during the height of covid just after um uh, lockdown had been lifted and uh people were starting to go outside again so yeah uh that's a little bit on the life of what it is like it is a very solitary lifestyle as i said in that video and what do we do out there what is the work that the turn wardens do on these colonies to help monitor and manage and protect these uh, very important seabirds Ooh, i've gone too fast sorry beg your pardon <laughs> yeah so in a brief caption, caption, that is what we are there for. We are there to protect and monitor breeding seabirds within the colonies, and that's within Rockabill and within Kilku and Port Tran. Uh, all the wardens are. So this is a couple of us. Um, is some of us sometimes you get very lucky a common turn might land on your head while you're standing there. Um, this is me in my first year, and this is one of the girls um, that was with me on my first year, Lorna. This is the group of us out in 2020 as we were about to go out to the nest census. So I took the photo, and we had Alex and my Michal. They were the two other wardens, Steve, our manager, and uh, we had some volunteers out with us. So some, so the two big sweeps that we do is we do a big nest census to count all the nests and then we do a ringing blitz which is we get to try to catch as many chicks as possible to try and ring all the chicks and that's when steve will bring out some volunteers or some ringers and some other people so uh, it becomes a little bit more populated and we have people to talk to um okay. so yeah how do we monitor and protect the birds through a lot of simple steps which as you might see aren't as simple but it is a simple they're like it is it's not too um hard to explain we do it through habitat management and we prevent disturbance and we do predator control we monitor the nests and the chicks through daily nest checks and through ringing and we gather a lot of data lots and lots of data so rockabill it has been going on for over 30 years we have enough data collected on rockabill to track the life cycles of these breeding rosy terns and common terns so we know some terns that are returning to nest on rockabill now are ones that were ringed 10 years ago or 12 years ago um or even longer uh the one oldest one we found uh during my time we found one that was 28 years old on rockabill um when we were ring re reading so yeah how do we clear the island of all the vegetation so in that video one of my fellow wardens mentioned mallow that's this plant here tree mallow this plant has become the absolute bane of my existence it's um, a horrible plant that grows all over the island horrible because it's very hard to get rid of um it's named tree mallow because it grows in this to be this like very large tree like uh thing it has a very wide trunk um, a very thick trunk and branches that are very diff that require some uh some muscle power to cut through and um as well as that the leaves it grows these very broad leaves that provide complete coverage and um, so 
the tree mallow was uh, intentionally planted in a couple of colonies throughout Europe to provide cover for the rosy terns. In some places it works, on Rockabill it definitely does not work. I think if all of the wardens throughout the years could uh, find the person who decided to plant tree mallow in Rockabill, they'd want to line up and take turns giving them a slap because it's absolutely awful to get rid of and it grows so quickly. So we go around at the very beginning of the season, one of our first big jobs is to just just get rid of all this tree mallow. We can't pull it up or um, uh, use chemicals to get rid of it because you can't use chemicals because it's a protected area. And But also you can't pull it up by the roots because the roots grow very deep. And when they grow very deep, they do pull up all this soil. And that soil needs to be there for the terns because that's what the ter rosy terns nest in. And that's where we plant all the boxes. So we plant all these nest boxes all over the island. They go anywhere there's soil or anywhere there's dirt, we try to plant, we put the nest boxes down. And um, we have a couple of hides dotted up around the island, so we will uh, need to put them up as well. They're all wooden flat packed hides that are, that are very durable and they do last throughout the season. Um, so that being said, in between 2020 and 2021, we lost some of the older hides thankfully we had some new ones made with some thanks to rosie turn life money and um, but uh to emphasize how climate change is affecting and how very big storms are affecting small island colonies like this in on rockabill um uh, in 2020 during a really bad storm one of the hides blew away and was one of the highs beside the helipad was blown right into the sea and we completely lost it. We found one side of it under the high helipad. And then in 2021, during another really, really big storm, three highs were blown away. And one of them we managed to recover. The other two were lost and completely destroyed. And we, we found one smashed to bits along the rocks. And But we have replaced all of those and they're a little bit more durable, also a little bit bigger, a little bit more roomy. Uh, nothing compared to some of the ones that we have on our nature reserves, but you can comfortably sit down in one of these hides to do some ring reading and take some photos and watch the birds. And it's uncomfortably, you can fit maybe three people packed in like sardines, which we've had to do sometimes when we've had visitors. And um, Kilku, it's a very large stretch of beach, shingle beach, and we fence off a section of the beach uh, with this long fence. And then we have a buffer zone. So I've marked it on this map here. This is the railway line that I was talking about, running uh, parallel to the sea. And this is the beach, and on this side was the re-wetted area for breeding lapwings. And so the turn wardens will be on this side. That's our little caravan that we stay in. Uh, we pop in to have a cup of tea or to have our breakfast in the mornings and our tea, our dinner at night. Um, in previous years, they had more than one caravan and people who were working on Rock Kilkul would stay up for the season and maybe go home for the weekend or go on holidays for like a weekend and for a few days. Since COVID, uh, they ha haven't allowed people staying in there because it's not really physical po possible with uh, social distancing. So it was restricted to only locals or people who were within driving range to get work on Rockabill. Um, in the middle of this um, fenced off area, we have our hide there. And um, so this buffer zone, we have a fence leading from the end of the beach, kind of a couple of meters down from the initial fenced off colony. And we put up signposts to direct the flow of foot traffic and flow of dog walkers to try and walk on this side and um, not disturb the turns as much. Most of the most of the time it works very well. A lot of people follow the rules and then they'll stop to read signs and to have a look at the birds. And the odd time you get some people who don't even notice that it's been fenced off. It ends the fence ends here because that's the tide line. So at high tide it meets in here. Sometimes knocks down the post and we have to put it back up. Um, uh, but that stretch uh, is where people won't be walking because they'll get their feet, unless they want to get their feet wet. Yeah, so 
this is what these signs looked like. They just say that it's, um, they just give a little bit of information of the birds and the site and redirect the flow up here onto the path. This is the sandy path. And in these kind of grasses here is where you'll find some ringed plover. And then out on the stony shingle part of the beaches, that's where the terns will nest. So uh, in terms of predator control, it differs from colony to colony. In Rockabill, our main predators are gulls. We have a greater black back gull and a herring gull. Occasionally we get a lesser black back gull, or a couple, um, not too many. Uh, the, they fluctuate and they take in turns. I, the greater black back gulls will go for the chicks and the terns, and the herring gulls are more likely to go for the eggs. Um, and then the odd time we also get some birds of prey. We've had a peregrine and we've had evidence of a merlin out there. Um, and but a lot of the time they might show they'll fly over, try to see what they can do, and the terns will dread and mob them and scare them off. They don't the gulls are there so often and have become so habituated to the island that if a gull comes into the colony the terns aren't really bothered by it uh, which is very surprising at this stage i'm i'd be sitting there trying to do some ringing and a gull will uh, land a couple of meters away in the middle of the colony and the terns won't do anything and i'll be like what? like this is bad parenting in my opinion um so how do we scare them off we have this agri laser which is a very high powered laser a lot of the gulls mainly uh, occupy the Bill. So we will go out at dusk and dawn to shine this laser at their feet and scare them off. And we try to make sure each it might take two or three attempts because they will fly off and then they'll reland and then they'll fly off again and reland again. So we have to do it a few times depending on numbers to make sure we try and get rid of them all. As well as that, human presence does a lot in a colony to uh, wade off predators. Um, the colony on Croquet Island, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but on Croquet Island in 2020 they weren't allowed to have wardens due to Covid and a pair of peregrine falcons came in and uh, decimated the Arc Arctic tern colony. They just had a buffet and uh, none of the Arctic terns nested there for that season. Uh, which was quite devastating. We had a few of the pairs show up on Rockabill. Uh, there was a bit of an influx of Arctic terns that year, but sadly we didn't have an um, increase in breeding pairs. We didn't find any more nests than 50 than we usually would. So I was really looking forward to hopefully getting some more Arctic terns that year, but it wasn't the case. Um, out on Kilkul, it's a little bit of a different story. So out on Kilkul, we do have to deal with mammals. And um, the main mammals we would have is box and uh, otter. And then, of course, this very bad boy, this little hedgehog as well, can be a very bad predator. In 2019, they had two hedgehogs get in through the electric fence and uh, eat all of the eggs at night and the wardens came back in the morning and loads of the nests had been predated and um, so these hedgehogs came in and just had a, a free for all really occasionally we get some gulls the gulls don't bother the little turn colony as much as they would on rockabill and as well as that we also get a couple of birds of prey around uh, we had a juvenile peregrine show up on the beach in 2019 and then this year out in Portran they had a Harris hawk which was from a collect a local collector and you know these local collectors will say that oh they're hand reared they don't know how to fend for themselves and meanwhile this Harris hawk got loose and he was able to fend for himself quite well out on Portran he got a lot of chicks got a lot of little turns throughout the season he was there for about two weeks before uh, he finally I went home. Um, so a lot of a lot of the work is done uh, by human presence presence on Kilkul, as well as uh, the night wardens. So Rock, uh, Kilkul wardens will do we do it in shifts. Uh, so there's 24 hour monitoring on the beach, 
and the day wardens like myself and the other lads will be out in, during the day and the night wardens come in uh, at 10 o'clock and they are licensed to shoot predators so they are licensed uh, gun owners and they do shoot foxes or otter if they have to but um, most of the time they don't get close enough to the colony we do have an electric fence around as well as the general like like fencing off for people and that prevents a lot of predators getting into the colony it's only if they kind of get too close to this fence or they're able to hop over this fence that the night ones uh, will shoot to kill um but it's not like going off like a fox hunt or anything you only do it if we absolutely have to and um, so human disturbance varies from colony to colony on Rockville, it's occasionally very, very rare, but occasionally it does happen. You might get some people showing up. It got very bad in 2020 once lockdown was lifted and we had so many people coming out, um, kayakers and fishing boats coming around around Rockville. And a couple of times, some people just uh, docked on the island and started wandering around and they didn't realise that there were people living on the island protecting the birds we if this ever happens we try to meet them on the pier we try to catch up to them and just say you're this is a special protected area you're trespassing you're not allowed to be here without permission and most of the time it's very nice people are very nice and they uh I'll just ask questions and then they leave uh sometimes uh, it might happen where you get someone kind of mean um but so, most of the time on Rockabill, you don't have to deal with people. Uh, on the other hand, down on Kilkool, uh, you have to deal with people all, all the time, every single day. Um, the, we direct the flow of foot traffic uh, of people and dog walkers, but these people walking in along the beach or like trying to get in beyond the fences and not pay any attention to the signs are the biggest cause of disturbance, which can be quite bad because you can't see the eggs uh, unless you knew what you were looking for. You wouldn't see these um, nesting turns or nesting ring plover and a lot of the nests do get trampled on if people are just not careful as well as that if a dog gets off lead uh, or um goes manages to get in into the fence uh, that's the biggest call like that's one of our bigger problems would be dogs who are not kept on the lead so we do try to meet people as much as we can if they do have their dogs off lead and just say can you please put your dog in a lead until you get past the fence and again most of them are fine sometimes uh they're not it depends on the person and <laughs> um, we chris has had to deal with um some nasty people over the years who say that oh i can let my dog off anywhere i live locally um but most people are very very nice and then the odd time as well you get some things like this very loud we've had jet skiers or parasailers or things like that and which doesn't seem like it might do much it seems like it's kind of far off away from the colony but it creates such an intense noise that it does cause the birds to um dread and mob and fly away uh leaving their nests vulnerable um so something like this it doesn't seem like it would be a disturbance but it is, can be very bad as well as like i said on rockabill drones flying overhead or helicopters things like any loud noises so we monitor the birds uh Quite rigorously on Rockabill and as rigorously as we can on Kilkool. On Rockabill, the island is divided up into sections. Um, within these sections are study areas, so they're smaller sections within these sections, and that provides us with a sample size of the overall population. And each warden takes a study, takes a couple of study areas, and they monitor the birds within their study area. Um, daily as rigorously as possible through ring reading and daily nest checks and then when the chicks hatch um all the chicks on rockabill are ringed so the wardens are in charge of ringing birds within their own study areas and then afterwards we have the big ringing blitz to try and ring all the birds on Kilkul, the beach is divided up into six sections, A through F, and this be the beach is monitored 
the shifts that we do are 6 a.m. in the morning until 2 o'clock and then 2 o'clock until 10 p.m. at night. So it's long hour, it's long periods and then um, the night winds come in there at 10 o'clock until the morning. Um, on Kilcool, nests are monitored daily um, by, net, by daily nest checks and again chicks are ringed as soon as possible. So on Rockabill we have two nest checks a day in the morning and in the evening to try and get a nice time scale on Kilkoo Beach um, because it's a smaller number um, the chicks um, chicks are ringed as soon as possible and nests are monitored for eggs or for chicks once a day and um, so methods are a little bit different um, but we do our best to try and keep it as rigorous as possible and um, these are the sections I was talking about out on Rockabill. So going this here is the pier and um, it's there in the photograph that I've taken off Google Maps. Um, this section is 4A North, then we have 4A South, 4B North, 4B South. Over here on the western side of the island uh, is 6 South and 6 North. So over the years the study areas have changed around a little bit and increased. Uh, the main study areas from the very beginning was 4A1 and 4A2, which was in here in 4A South, and 4B1 and 4B2 here in 4B South. So these small study areas within the main bigger sections. Um, then we have hides set up. We have one hide here between the helipad and 4B1, and then one hide here beside 4B2. The one in 4A, the hide was originally up here in the garden. This is that garden in front of the lighthouse keeper's house. And then uh, a couple of years later, when we got a new, newer hide in uh, 2017, they put it in between the two study areas here. So, um, Throughout the time with Rosie Turn Life, colonies and project managers from different colonies developed new methods to help better protect the birds and better provide space for nest boxes for Rosie Turns. One of the ways that they did that was through terracing. So Steve tried to do some on Rockabill. Um, up here on the western side of the island here, it's a lot more rocky. Um, a lot more granite rock, but there is a little bit of soil up here towards the edge of this back wall behind the lighthouse. He terraced off some of the soil and some of the area and uh, created a nice area for nest boxes here and it stretches on up until the edge of this wall here. And then um, some areas in there were terraced off even further and flattened a little bit more. They were turned into study areas. So there's this six south and six north uh, this is the main of all those areas this is the main sections which has nest boxes and then we have two smaller sections within that six south upper terrace and six north upper terrace they are both study areas and again they have a hide in between them and um, to uh, do some ring reading and then some terracing was done down here in 4A North, just above the pier. So we have um, 4A North upper terraces that was turned into a study area in 2019. And then here in 4B North, some terracing was done. These terraces are developed to look like very like stair steps, essentially. So boards are put uh, to push the ground in and the area is filled in within these boards to flatten it like you would terrace kind of in a, a flower bed or things something like that in your garden and then the nest boxes are placed on the flat earth so here in 4b north we got to do quite a lot of those terraces um this is very stony very sloping area but we managed the, to get some terraces built from the stones all the way up to the path here and then on this side uh, beyond this little line it's a little bit, soil is a little bit looser, a little bit more deadly to step on. And um, so we did do, there have been some terraces built in there, but they're a little bit more flimsy. And, um, but we do get some, a good few boxes in there as well. And, um, but so what has happened with those terraces is changed that the soil we can now fit. We went from fitting 
a couple of um, dozen boxes out there to now we can fit uh, up to 100 boxes within these areas here you can we get over 100 boxes here in 4a north upper terraces and uh, almost 200 boxes and down here in 4b north and this section here they're the first three three uh, stepped terraces are study areas and there's about 70 boxes within that it's the one of the larger study areas the next uh, set of study areas which are also very important are the gardens where the common terms prefer most of the common terms will occupy the gardens going clockwise or, or anti-clockwise around the lighthouse i beg your pardon um we have garden one garden two on this side of the lighthouse so that's garden one here that's garden two this one here is garden three which we nicknamed the tank gardens they have these do two big circles are tanks of water that they used to use before the lighthouse was uh, made electric when it was still gas and that was filled with water to <laughs> help uh, in case of a fire now that water is just disgusting and stagnant and filled with algae blooms each year and um, so it's quite nasty and we have to cover these tanks over to help protect any chicks from falling in um, and then in here in front of the lighthouse keeper's house is garden five i don't know what happened to garden four i don't know if it was lost some years ago or if it never existed um, or if someone just miscounted but yeah so this is garden five here and these two two sections were uh cornered off within garden five to be a study area there they are and over here garden one was divided into garden one east and garden one west these this line here is the solar panels and garden one east is a study area now these are very small gardens uh or very large gardens compared to whereabouts you live but you get hundreds and hundreds of common terns nesting in there in garden one east you could easily get over a hundred common terns nesting in your area and then we put some boxes in around the walls to try and encourage rosia terns as well so on kill cool we have the six sections fenced off all the nests are marked with these numbered stone so we find a nice flat stone and we paint a number on it this is number 300 which we thought was quite an achievement that we got up to this year and three stones are placed around the nest to be visible from the path and from either side of the colony so whether you're looking from the hide from this direction that you're looking north or whether you're looking south you'll be able to see the number of each nest and um, so this is a little collection of all the nests from 2022 the green dots are active nests that hatched and fledged and the little green ones with red around it are nests that hatched but the chicks were predated the red ones are nests that were predated and destroyed so either they were predated as eggs or they were destroyed before the chicks hatched the yellow ones are um ones that were inviable and the or, and then the blue ones here were ones that were washed out and the black ones i think were ones that were abandoned or made in, inviable and then the two stars here are the oyster catcher nests here and um, so a very large collection um, and and it takes a while to move within each section to find each nest and to make check each nest for eggs or for chicks but how we do it is we try to find the nest from the hide go out to try and find the nest within the colony uh, from looking for looking from special markers that we saw from the hide and if we find one we mark it with these three stones so the nest checks on uh go through some of the nest checks the next chests on rock bill like i said are done morning and night this helps us to get a nice timeline of uh establishing the lay dates the hatch dates and then hatching success so you have a little graph down here and um, this shows the number of nests that were initiated each week 
and you have it kind of starts off slow and a couple you get a couple couple of days and then you might come back in another few days and there'll be a couple more nests and then within one week you just get this massive boom with loads and loads of nests showing up everywhere loads of boxes with eggs loads of nests being found outside of boxes loads of common turn nests being found and each one is marked has to be marked and checked for an egg and then checked the next day to see if there's any more eggs and so then it starts to teeter off and kind of slow down again and by the time we get to kind of to the end of may uh, most nests have finished and the chicks kind of start to hatch around end of may early june and then here afterwards after this stage any we consider any nest that we find then as late nesters so turns that might have showed up a little bit later or maybe they tried and then they relayed some eggs or maybe one partner got there on time and one partner was very late or was uh, got lost in a storm and then showed up a little bit later but they still managed to breed these late nesters don't always survive they don't always hatch and don't always fledge but some of them have and um, we try to focus most of um the nest monitoring is focused on the first round of next nests that are initiated. Emma, it's Nigel speak. Uh, Hi, sorry, I'm going a little level. bit too long, am I? Um, yes, I think if you could try and round it up, it's super that you're getting into some of the, the data collection, which is very interesting. But I think we'll probably have to round it up in five minutes or so. Emma. Yeah, of course. I'll Thank you. Here. Sorry. Um, Thank you. So this is just some photos of us doing the nest uh, census that I was talking about area. Every area has to be checked outside of the study areas and all of them are marked with peg common turns and the uh, open nests roseate nests are marked with pegs and each box has to be checked for eggs all around the area and then we also check the holes for black gilly moths and we try to look for some kitty wakes down on kill cool we look uh, for nests from the hide this is a nice picture of hide it gives you a nice chance to do some scope photography so we try and find a nest and try and uh, see through incubation checks uh, where we see a little turn sitting down on a nest and then we mark it on a map we draw a little rough map on our notebook go out into the colony and try to find it and it can be quite difficult to spot the eggs it takes some time but uh, once we find it we mark it with those three stones and then we mark it on a google map that we share uh, to help us create that image that i showed you here this is just a picture of what the eggs look like in amongst the stones they're very well camouflaged and you kind of have to watch where you step all the time whenever you're out on the beach and um, to make sure you don't step on any eggs because there'd be some times where i definitely think oh that's a stone no it's an egg you have to mark it around uh, early july or early june sorry that's when the chicks start hatching that's when the craziness starts i will be wrapping up sure sure i'm going to quickly go through these all i've got for the next few slides are some nice photos of chicks these are rosier chicks they're a little bit more spiky and uh, compared to the very very fluffy common turn chicks here and um, and then we have an ar some arctic chicks which are gorgeous and fluffy as well a little bit smaller than common terns and a bit harder to differentiate but they have this nice gray buff underneath them so how you differentiate them a lot most of the time is from actually looking at the underside and um, these are some little turns out on kill cool the little turns are absolutely tiny so so small compared to any other turn species and um, they're they kind of like they that's one in the hand there for comparison. They're so small and gorgeous. And some other birds out there, out in both colonies. This is some a nice timeline sort of of a black guillemot. Very, very small when they hatch until they get very, very chunky and chubby. And um, in between, just when they're about to get their pins and start to get the beginning of feathers, they start to look a little bit like demonic monsters <laughs> until they start to get these lovely sleek feathers again. Uh, Kitty wake chicks are a little bit bigger than the common guillemots, but they they've got these very very small wings at the start, and then these big chubby bums, and um, and they tuck in quite very they very very close to the wall. So when you're looking down from the top, it can sometimes be hard to spot them. 
down in Kilku, we had some oyster, these are some oyster catcher chicks. Once they hatched, uh, they were all nice and scraggly. And then a day later, they were walking away and the parents were leading them over into the wetlands where, to forage and to be away from the terns a little bit more safe. And then these are some photos of ring plovers here. Um, um very very tiny so hard to find again with as with any wader once they hatch they run off so if you found a ringed plover chick and you managed to get a photo of a ring plover chick it was considered a very good day <laughs> for any of us um so i will say here due to avian flu we weren't able to continue ringing we did a little bit of ringing on kill cool and rockabill in 2022 but uh, when the ring suspension was put in place, uh, we couldn't do any biometrics or any um, ringing on any of the colonies, but I'll just quickly run through it. I don't have any uh, details of biometrics on Kill Cool because I didn't do any this year, but essentially what biometrics is, is it's a measurement of the physiological characters. So we weigh the chicks and we measure their wings. Each warden on Rockabill chooses 30 rosier turns and 30 common turns to give us a nice and um, good sample size of about 90 nests. And um, so 90 nests can be uh, three common turn chicks per nest, two rosier turn per nest. So it gives us good, good, good number. And they're weighed daily, weighed and measured daily until they fledge. But uh, from the numbers from this graph, you can see we have a nice steady incline and then it starts to get a bit wild here at the end. And that's because from about this time onwards, when they start to move around, the rosier turns aren't staying inside the boxes all the time. So sometimes they can be hard, to, a lot harder to find. You go down and uh, one day they're not there. You might find them a week later or two weeks later and you get to measure them again. So they're measured from the day they hatch, which is day zero to day 30. But realistically, we might get up to maybe day 20 of good measurements uh, before they start to fledge between day 24 and day 27. All the birds on all of our colonies, we try to ring as many chicks as possible, if not all of them. These are uh, my fellow wardens and some of our staff, Birdwatch Ireland staff members that come out during the ringing blitz on Rockabill to try and help us ring all of them. We do it, try to do it quite strategically. We take it section by section to do a big sweep through each. We check each boxes and ring all the chicks in each box and as well as trying to catch as many common turns as we can. The common turns are a little bit more difficult because they run about two or three days after they've hatched so they can be quite hard to find or to hard to catch but we do do our best to just round them all up and place a ring on each one and um, this is Chris ringing at a nest in Kilkool so we would try to ring them as soon as they hatch or maybe a day after they hatch because they are quite small and sometimes the rings they have to grow into them and um, so we will do them as soon as we find them some chicks and uh, from nest to nest and this was taken before ring and suspension was stopped and we uh, ringing was stopped and we couldn't uh, do any visit any nests and um, but any that we miss we did try to do sweeps again from section to section we all lined up along the beach and just walked down uh, going very very slowly trying not to step on any chicks or step on any uh, eggs uh, so you need to be very careful when you're trying to round up the little turns and catch them for ringing <laughs> uh, this can turn into nice game of hide and seek common turns and ro rosy turns they'll try to hide under rocks under bushes anywhere they can in little cracks and crevices someone's bum poking out from under a crack in the wall uh, or they will lie down nice and flat to try and camouflage themselves and they then on Kill Cool is very much the same ring. You might get them hiding behind the fence posts or behind any rock or under rocks. So this one was hiding under a like, tiny little bit of sea um, seaweed because it was so small it just fit under a little bit. Um, so when they are hiding under these rocks and things and stones, uh, that like it just shows how careful you have to be when you're not to step on anything. <laughs> And then the kittywigs require a little bit of climbing because they all are cliff nesting birds, but we will go out to the bill and go on to the rock along the rock and climb up the cliffs to try and catch them and with a hook or try and catch them by hand and then ring them and put them back in the nest. 
So ring reading, this last thing I'm going to talk about, I'm only going to talk a little bit briefly about ring reading. Uh, we consider ring reading very, very important in relation to data. It allows us to determine where these birds are recited, shows us their life cycle and uh, what they're doing after Rockabill or beyond. Um, so ring reading takes up a lot of time before the chicks hatch. Uh, that's when it just gets mad and there's not enough time. Um, here in 2021, over 95% of birds that were recited on Rockabill were hatched and ringed on Rockabill. The oldest one we found was from 1993, and then the youngest one was found from 2019, and I was absolutely devastated that it was not one of the birds that I rang in my first year. Um, but it was one, it wasn't a breeding bird, it was one that was kind of uh, two years old and popping around just to investigate the land. And hopefully that bird is there breeding now, uh, or will be breeding, was breeding in 2022 and will be breeding in 2023. And 3% or almost 4% came from Ladies Island. And then we had two that we found breeding were from Cockay. And um, so the ring reading is done from the hides. It's very easy to do ring reading on Rockabill because they're so close to you. Not as easy on Kilcoo. But this is the bird that I showed you a little bit earlier. He was the Welsh little turn that showed up and was nesting on Kilcool Beach. We cut, it was recited and recaught on Kilcool one of the days that we were ringing adults in the beginning of the season. Um, so it was very good. So, and then some other things we had is we had a pair from Skerries, or they were recited in Skerries in August of this year and they had these codes on the rings these four digit metal codes on metal rings are um what we put on the roseate turns which are individual uh, roseate uh, specialized roseate turn rings and um, so this pair were seen um together in scaries this year at the end of the season one was from 2010 and the other one was from 2016 they were both um ringed and hatched on rockabill to look something to show you to look out for those codes on the rosier turn ring this is one of the codes from the pre that, that i just showed you they go um horizontally from uh, they'll have the four of them on top of each other and one two dz so it'll uh, that one that you saw one two dz it'll be one two at top and then dz at the bottom and those four digits most of them from the last couple of the years are only letters but previously in previous years there were no, were numbers and letters so that's what you need to look out for on rockabill they are rosy turns are ringed on the right leg and on ladies island they're ringed on the left leg so that's how we differentiate the which turns came from which location. Common turns are ringed with standard BTO rings uh, with a small metal ring on the right leg. And um, they last few years they begin with ST. Other uh, they usually begin with S on Rockabill. Other years they've been like SZ or SL. Um, and then they'll have five numbers and then the little turns are ringed with the bto uh, ring uh, same as the commons on kilkul they're ringed on the right leg and on portran they're ringed portran and baltre they're ringed on the left leg and that's how we differentiate which turns come from which colony it's depending on which leg the ring is on and then a couple of little turns were color ringed this year the little turns from ireland have a green color ring and then you have your ones from Wales have this yellow colouring. So if you are out with your scope or with your binoculars and you get a chance and you see a bird, you see a turn with a ring, try your best to read it if you can. It can take some practice. It's a little bit difficult with some birds uh, than it is with others. And if you do manage to see one with a ring and you manage to record it, um, if you report it to the BTO, um Birdwatch Ireland will be notified and then we'll be able to see uh, where our birds have ended up. <laughs> so um, that's why I'm going to finish up here just for anyone who would like to know a little bit more information. There's a documentary that avail is available to look at for free online. It was filmed by a former warden on Rockabill a couple of years ago and then it was released in 2019. If you Google Crow Crag Productions, um, that's their production company that they created, and um, you can watch the 
uh, documentary on their website. And then if you go on to the Birdwatch Ireland YouTube channel, um, my mentor and manager, uh, Dr. Steve Newton, our head of seabird conservation, he did a webinar last year on Rockabill. It was like this, a Zoom talk, and it was recorded and it's available on our YouTube channel. And then there's me if you want to ask me any more questions or if you want to learn a bit more, see any more of my photos, you can follow me on my socials. My main two are Instagram and uh, Twitter. Um, and then as well as that, there was a documentary filmed on uh, Rockabill Island with Moon, uh, Derek Mooney, who runs, he does a radio show every week called Mooney Goes Wild. It's a very, very popular wildlife presenter in Ireland. So it was a very big deal when he came out to Rockabill. And um, it aired on RTE in March 2021. It is still available on RTE Player. I think uh, if you're in the UK, you need a VPN to view it. Um, but it was aired on BBC Scotland uh, in, uh, in earlier 2022 and in late 2021. So I think it might be available on the BBC iPlayer if you're lucky you can have a look for it. If you Google back to from the brink, you might be you might be able to find it. So yeah, and um, for um, any students who want to know, you can ask me about this. I put this in there. And um, if anyone wants to le learn about how to work on Rockabill, but that's all I will leave there. And um, so thanks very much for listening to me ramble on and on and on. I'm so sorry um, I took up too much of your time and um, if anyone has any more questions they can get in touch with me i'll hand it over to nigel now thank you very much indeed Emma. that was very comprehensive very intimate uh, uh, description of your several seasons on rockabill and kilcool i found myself comparing it with uh, what little i know of the scaries and uh, the flincher little town colony it was fascinating to compare them um and i'm so glad that your work also included uh, so much data collection. Um, I'm sure that is going to be a, a real feature of the, of the Rockabill um, work in the future, being able to compare to, in such a historic way with productivity in seasons past, um, particularly as we go into such an uncertain future for seabirds with climate change. That sort of uh, very detailed uh, and very consistent data collection is so important. Um, as indeed for you personally is getting that direct experience of monitoring, handling, observing seabirds, which came over so well this evening. Thank you very much indeed. You certainly gave us a true picture of what it's like uh, to be a warden on an offshore island as well as uh, a beach, uh, beach warden. Uh, fascinating stuff and good luck with your future work with, a, I hope there is a future for you with more seabird work um uh, indeed whatever whatever you go on to do i'm sure this last few years will uh, be a great platform for you so thank you for sharing your experiences this evening um on behalf of all of the bird group i'll say good night thank you